if I could persuade you to believe what tonight I hope I well, I will try to. Your entire world would change. You hear the word God, the word Jehovah, the word Lord, the word Jesus, the word Christ, and you think of something other than yourself. One that is greater, one that you would worship. Tonight it is my purpose to show you that God and the eye of man are one. When you say I am, that is the God of Scripture. Confined as you are, you think, how could it be? God created the universe and sustains it. And here I am like a little worm, three score in ten years, and then I vanish. But now let us turn to Scripture. We turn now to the 16th chapter of Matthew. And the question is asked of the disciples, the followers, those who have heard him. And he said to them, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they reply, well, some say, John the Baptist, come again. Others, Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And the spokesman called Peter, answered and said, thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. And he said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar -Jonah, for flesh and blood could not have told you this, but my Father who is in heaven. So here he equates the Son of Man with the eye of man, not the organ that sees, or through which you see, but your sense of awareness, that I am this, when you are aware of being, your consciousness, your human imagination. So he equates the two, the Son of Man spoken of in the Old Testament and brought forward into the New, is nothing more than the I of man, and he calls it the Christ, and defines Christ as the Son of God. Now we find Christ being defined in the New Testament as the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the eye of man is the power of God and the wisdom of God. If man does not know it, well then he will not exercise that power. He will not exercise that wisdom. So tonight I am trying to persuade you that when you say I, before you say anything, that that is the power and the wisdom of God. And you can't separate the power of God and the wisdom of God from God. So you will say in the end, I and my Father are one, for he is called the Son of God. Now we are called upon to test this, if it be true. Can we test it? I hope you'll put it to the test. When I tell you that your own wonderful I am this is God, though prior to that you believe that you are little something, moving across the earth for a few years, 70 years, and then you will vanish in the hope of some restoration, but a hope. No assurance. But now I'm going to tell you that you really are God. Your own wonderful consciousness, your human imagination, that is the God of Scripture. And there is no other God. Imprisoned as you are in these bodies of flesh, you did it for a purpose. 
Now let us see what it tells us about this son of man that is now equated with the eye of man. No one has ever ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. You'll read that in the third chapter, the 13th verse of John. So here we find you are a pre-existent being. No one can ascend into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Your ascension in the next verse, the 14th verse, is showing you how you ascend. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's all imagery, and yet it is true. You descended into generation in a world of death where everything begins, it waxes, it wanes, and then it disappears. But there's something in you, clothed in this garment, that does die. That is pre-existent. And its home is heaven, which is harmony. You gave it up completely. You aren't pretending that you're a man. You descended into man. You became man. With all the weaknesses, all the limitations, all the restrictions of man, to experience this world of death and decay. There will come a moment in time that you will ascend from this restriction, taking with you the experience that is yours because of this restriction. And you will ascend in the same manner that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That was an adumbration. That was a foreshadowing. You will rise from the base of your spine, up your spine into your own skull, for heaven is within you. And you will rise like a fiery serpent without any loss of identity. The form you wear, I hesitate to describe it. I will tell you that your face is human, your hands are human, your voice is human, but do not ask me to describe the body that you wear. It's infinite power, infinite wisdom, and yet it is a form. You are that fiery being that descended, not because of anything that was wrong when you descended. The fall is not because of any mistake on our part. It's a predetermined plan to come down into the world of death and decay and overcome it. If coming down, wearing these garments, we knew who we were, Pretending that we were men, we could not accomplish it. Any more than an actor on the stage, pretending that he is Hamlet, can actually play that part. He has to actually assume it, but even then it is still with a little something in his mind. He knows he is the great actor who tonight will go home to his lovely home. And he'll take off the garment and hang it up once more and tomorrow he'll replay the play. You don't do that in this play of God. You don't take off the garment. You wear it for your three score in ten and if by strength your four score or maybe even longer or shorter. But the eye of man is the God of scripture. Put it to the test. Let me now, first of all, before we go into the testing of it, make clear what I said on the last lecture night, Friday night, prompted by a question that was asked here. For I had said in the previous lecture that there are ranks in heaven as they are on earth, for this is only a copy. 
Everything here is a shadow. It's a copy of the eternal realities. And in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul describes the eight right. He does it many times, but he never changes the first two. The first is always the apostle. The second, the prophet. The third, the teachers. And then he goes on. Miracle workers, healers, helpers, administrators, and the speakers in town. But he never changes the first and second, the apostle and the prophet. You might think, because I told you I am saint, and the word saint means an apostle, that I am appropriating unto myself a certain first rank. But no, to put your heart at peace, I'm going to quote the 11th chapter Romans. As of old, for there are always a remnant of old, and the remnant simply means the elect of God. You're not elected because you're born by accident into some ethnic group. It has nothing to do with that. A descendant of Abraham after the flesh is not necessarily the elect of God. You are chosen from any race, any nation, any religion. While how the choice is made, no one knows. It remains the Father's secret. But Paul qualifies it in this manner. There is a remnant to this day called by grace. And if by grace, then it is not on the basis of work. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Therefore, no one who is called and sent can brag. If he brags, he is not the sent. Because it's all by grace. He didn't earn it. It's not by merit. It is simply a secret known only to the Father. So when we are called, incorporated into the body of infinite love, who is God, and then sent, let no one who is sent raise a finger to brag, to boast, for it is all by grace. Read it in the 11th chapter, the 5th and 6th verses of Paul's letter to the Romans. So now I have stated that, so do not think for one moment when I tell you I have been called and sent that in any way I am trying to act superior. For there is no intrinsic superiority to those who are called. Now, he uses an analogy, which I do not think adequate, but you can read it in the book itself. He uses the analogy of the human form, that not all are head, eyes, nose, teeth, and so on. But that is a weak analogy. Nevertheless, he uses that to show you the different parts in one body. But now to come back to make this a very practical night. Believe me that when you say I, before you say I am John, I am Bill, I am this, I am that, I am the other, you are declaring yourself to be, and that sense of being is God. That's God. Now what are you going to put on it? All things are possible to God. All things. You could say now, as you're seated here, after first affirming that I am, you could then assume that I am, and you name exactly what you want to be. If you believe what I tell you about your own I amness, and remain faithful to what you have assumed, that assumption will harden into fact. When you pray, 
in the true sense of the word, you do not pray to any external God. That was my command when I was sent.